All right. Uh, so yeah, like I said, my name is Jack O'Connor. Uh, so this is Bow. Bow is a hash function. Uh, it's very fast, and you can do some cool things with it. Hopefully, my screen won't go to sleep for the rest of the talk. Uh, I know there are a lot of people here who use hash functions all the time, know exactly what they are. Um, hopefully, there are some people here who don't use hash functions all the time, and maybe don't even know exactly what they are. Uh, my girlfriend and my roommate are here, and they know because I tell them about my projects and make them listen. Uh, but in the spirit of having everyone's friends come to these things, I'll start with a, a brief you know, introduction into how hash functions work. Um, even before that, some caveats. You know, we're talking about speed. Uh, benchmarks are nothing but lies. Anyone who tells you different is selling something. Um, fastest should be used in scare quotes anytime that it's used. Uh, everything depends on what hardware you're on. Hash functions that are fast on really tiny inputs, maybe slower on larger inputs, and so on. So, scare quotes. Uh, Bow is not stable. Uh, if you use Bow today and then hash the same function in like two months, you'll get a different answer uh, because some of the parameters are going to change. Uh, so if anybody is using a, hash, a project, writing a project that needs a fast hash function, give me like a month. Uh, and cryptography is hard. Uh, right? You know, designing crypto uh, algorithms and, and implementations runs into all sorts of tricky problems, um, and you really need professionals to help you sort them out. So whenever we design code that's actually to be used in production for cryptographic purposes, uh, we pull in the professionals. Uh, and that's what's happening here, too. So, what is a hash function exactly? Many of us know. Um, take a file of any size, output a number. You know, there are many different hash functions out there. MD5 is probably the most widely known of people's heads, to the extent that anyone has ever heard of the names of hash functions. Uh, SHA1 and SHA2 are also very common. Uh, they give different answers for the same file. But the important thing is, as many of us have seen before, you hash a different file, the same function gives a different answer. Like the hash stands in for the contents of the file. Um, even the tiniest tweak, single byte difference uh, in a file should give a totally different hash when you hash it. Um, how do we use that sort of thing? It comes up a lot on the internet. Uh, most of the time when we're hashing things by hand, it's because we've downloaded a gigantic file, you know, like a Linux install disk, maybe something like that. Other than that, lots of things use hash functions under the covers. Uh, BitTorrent would use them. Any security protocol uses them all over the place. But here you can see a, a, a clip from the Arch Linux download page. Um, and they're actually giving you the hash of the disk image you've downloaded so you can manually check it. That's the kind of thing we use them for. And a quick, quick overview of how most normal, what we're going to call serial hash functions, uh, work on the inside. Uh, is that you have something called a compression function. It doesn't matter exactly what that is, but it takes a couple of inputs and produces a single output. Divide the file up into a bunch of blocks that are all the same size, except for maybe the last one, and just repeatedly call the compression function, compressing each block in one after the other after the other. Uh, again, the details don't super matter here. What an initialization vector is, doesn't matter. Uh, the important thing to notice here is these arrows. Um, in particular, each one depends on the output of the previous block. So there's, you can't start any work on this guy until all these guys are done. That's a feature of the way most hash functions are designed. Um, and the, you know, the reason they're designed that way is you end up with a very, very small state. The state that goes in and out of the compression function is like, like a kilobyte or something, you know, depending on what hash function you're talking about. So that very small hardware uh, can implement these functions. And they often do, like routers. But it's time for the first demo. I've made, I made you guys wait too long already. Uh, so let's look at why we're here. And the first big reason we're here is we can do a lot faster than this. Let's see it happen. I don't know if the microphone's going to pick me up like this. We'll see. So, so I have here a gigabyte file, 954 megabytes according to LS, which is that whole like 1000 versus 1024 thing. No one cares. Um, let's hash it and see how long that takes. So some people saw my lightning talk on this a couple months ago. Uh, some of you will have seen this demo before. Whenever you hash things, you always hash them twice because you need to make sure the files in the kernel's memory page hash thing. Um, also, to be clear, we are looking at this number, the total time. So that's MD5. Uh, SHA-1 is faster. I was going to be like 1.3, something like that. 
Um, unfortunately, MD5 and trial one are both broken hash functions. They're a little bit old. Um, if we're doing anything uh, with new code, we're supposed to be using something like SHA-2. So let's try SHA-512, which is one of the SHA-2 variants. It's an actual modern hash function. It still works. 1.8, that's a little slow, a little depressing. Uh, let's see what that is. So that's what we call an order of magnitude uh, in the business. It's very, very fast. Um, and the next part of this talk, we'll be talking about why exactly that is. By the way, if there's any questions or anybody wants to interrupt me or anything like that, just raise your hand or just yell. Actually, just yell. I won't see the hands. <laughs> Let's go back here. So, why is about 10 times faster than SHA-2? I mean, you know, SHA-1, SHA-2, if SHA you find know, all these hash functions, they are, they are designed by very, very smart people to be as fast as possible. Um, and the main reason is parallelism. So take a look at this. So unlike, let me flash back, unlike the traditional design, you might call that the Merkle dam guard construction or any number of other buzzwords, unlike the traditional design of a serial hash function, a tree hash looks like a tree, no surprise. Um, some of the same stuff is happening, so we still sort of break the input up into a bunch of different blocks, um, and then we hash those blocks, but we don't feed the output into the next block every time. Anymore. Instead, we feed it upwards. So we take the hash of two blocks, concatenate those two hashes, hash that. You know, do the same thing over here, hash that, concatenate those and hash them, and then however many more blocks we have, just keep doing that. Up and up and up. We call that a binary tree. A lot of people have done a lot of binary trees, mostly interview problems, I think. We rarely actually use one at work, but finally get a chance. Um, there is some extra overhead here. So in the previous Example, again, we just take the output of each compression function and feed it right into the next one. And here, each output kind of goes through more than one step. Um, if we remember our, our high school limits, uh, it's, there's going to be about twice as many parent nodes as there are leaf nodes in this tree. And that does represent some work, uh, hashing all of those. In order to reduce that overhead, usually the tactic we use is we make these blocks pretty big, so that hashing the blocks just takes a lot more time than hashing the parents. You can kind of like paper over that. So that, that overhead ends up being pretty low. Upsides, this whole thing is parallelizable. So just by looking at it, we can hash this and this at the same time. We can do it on two different threads. Uh, we can do it using SIMD, we'll actually get to that. That does both. Um, as many threads as you have can start working on all these blocks, and that work can be coalesced by some master thread or something like that. So you can really take advantage of the parallelism that modern hardware offers. Uh, the, and that's, that's the upside that we just saw in that nice little demo. The other big upside is streaming features, and we'll get into the, we'll, we'll get into what exactly that means. But you might note that back here. Say with a traditional serial hash, you were interested in verifying block two. Maybe you just wanted like some frame from a movie or something like that. If you have the hash output at the end, the only way you can verify that block two is correct is to rehash the whole thing. Make sure you get the same answer, which is what we're used to doing, rehash the whole thing. The small files, nobody cares, but if, if the file is a giant movie, maybe over the network, we'd love to be able to like just deal with block two or whatever stretch of blocks we need. With a tree hash, we can do that. So for example, if I have the root hash and I want to verify block two or something, or maybe start playing from block two or seek or whatever you know, an application might want to do, I can do that instead of hash rehashing the whole thing to make sure that the whole file is valid. I can just take, if I do a lot of bookkeeping, I can just take this path down to block two so I can verify the hash of the root node hash of this guy and this guy, and those are all small. There's a logarithmic number of them on the way down, it's binary tree, and then I hash block two. So with very little overhead, um, I can extract block two and verify that it matches the root hash. Um, to do that, I need primitive bookkeeping. I need to have, for example, to verify the root hash, I need this node, because they both have been intuitive inputs. I don't need anything below that node, but I need it. So there's a bunch of things that I need on the way down, but it's not much work. Let's see that in action. There'll be a demo in a second, but this is just sort of an eyeball. Um, so I have my movie on MP4. Let's say that's a giant file. 
Uh, I can hash it, you know, spits out a hash, just like we saw we're familiar with. <laughs> I can encode it. The, the encoding format is a way of saying, so normally, let me back up a bit, normally when you hash a file, maybe you know, there's all the intermediate state, all those intermediate pair nodes in the tree, whatever you're doing, you throw all those away, you don't really care about this little hash. Normally, that's, that's often what we do. But to do that sort of streaming stuff, like I said, you need to keep those nodes around. So the encoding format is a way of doing that. Uh, so it takes all those chunks of data, all those chunks of input, and all the parent nodes they can generate, and it lays them all out in a single continuous file. Uh, it lays them in pre-order, that's the buzzword for uh, tree traversals, so that the decoder can grab all the nodes that it needs and verify the things that it needs. Uh, so here we see bow encode creates an encoded file. So my movie on the dot bow is like, the encoded version of my movie. It's, you, you can sort of conceptually think of it as like dot .zip. You know, it's like a different format that like contains some stuff. It doesn't do compression, it does hashing. And then down here, decoding. So decoding requires the hash. So we actually just repeat that command from above and capture it as a shell variable. Then pass it into decode. And the standard output of the decode command is going to be the original file, except it's verifying the hash in every chunk as it goes. Uh, you can see that VLC, everyone's favorite VLC movie player, actually can play from standard input, which is pretty cool. We don't usually do that, but in this case, we're going to do it. Um, and right before we get into the next demo of these streaming features, um, there's actually quite a lot we can do. So if you, if you look at the, the documentation, the dash dash help on bow, um, you see a bunch of commands. Encode and decode we just talked about. Decode actually takes some flags, like you can see into the middle. We were just talking about how you draw that path down the tree. You can say, hey, start decoding from you know, the byte one billion, or whatever, that works fine. Slicing um, is a very cute little tactic where, say I want to be able to seek into a movie file or something, well, if I have it locally, and it's encoded fine, uh, if it's over the network, you know, I might have a seek interface you know, over my HTTP connection, and I can, I can hack that together, or I can say, hey, server, why don't you give me an encoded slice? Like, take that whole encoding and just pull out the parts that I know I'm going to need when I see. Uh, and just send those to me. And then using the exact same hash, no, no, no change to the hash, I can verify that slice. We're not going to bother demoing that, but it's fun. OK. So this is, uh, this is what I was trying to get the sound configured for. Uh, you, I, you guys will probably hear it coming off my laptop anyway. Let's play a movie. So this is everyone's favorite dinosaur. Uh, a lot of people who grew up near here will recognize this from popular children's television. It's Barney the dinosaur. <laughs> this is very wholesome, lovely. You know, if uh, if cryptography is good for anything, it should it should be good for uh, protecting children's entertainment. So let's do that. So let, first, let's just show encoding and decoding. No, we're not going to not going to corrupt anything or attack. You know, just, let's just run the happy path. More Barney 2 for now, you know, we're going to get to him. Uh, so first I'll just encode this file. So I say bow code. If I forget the order like this, it's going to be embarrassing. Bow code Barney 1. Let's call it Barney dot bow. That's pretty good. It's not a very, not a very big file. Uh, and if I look at the size of everything, again, uh, you can ignore Barney 2 for now. We'll get to him. Barney 2 is the evil file. Um, you can see that Barney 1 is 797, about 800 kilobytes. Barney.bow in the encoded version is a little bigger, so there's some overhead. Again, all those parent nodes got interspersed you know, between all the chunks in, in pre order. Uh, but not much overhead. You know, the, the chunks are pretty large, the parent nodes are pretty small, so it ends up being like 1% or something. I can't remember exactly. So you can see it's a little bit of overhead, not much. And we can decode. So I'll do what I did before. I'll say hash equals. See that, but just a hash, whatever. And I can use that to decode. So I'll say val decode, give it the hash, and I say barney.val, and I'll pipe that in. You'll see. I'm not sure what Great. Uh, so that's encoding and decoding real quick. Now, if I encode a different file, 
Let's, see, let, let's, let's take a look at a different file. So these files are very similar. They start the same way. In fact, they start with the same bytes. I, I carefully arranged for that to be the truth. Um, but there's a little difference. <laughs> so this one, this one changes that. Before. So this this is the uh, this is the evil attacker trying to corrupt our uh, beloved children's entertainment. Um, and if I if I take that uh, attacker provided file and if I just encode it in the normal legitimate not corrupt way, it's different files. Of course, it's going to also a different hash. And those hashes are going to be different. Some some of the chunks. I guess actually, let's see that real quick. So if I compare. So CMP is the Unix command that shows us the first differing byte. So the first mm, 400 kilobytes ish of those files are identical, um, and that's by construction that I made them that way this morning, which was fun. Uh, I had to learn some new FFmpeg commands. Uh, those files are identical to 400 kilobytes. So the first, you know, however many chunks will be identical, and, and the parent nodes that only cover those chunks will be identical. But then eventually the difference will bubble up, and of course the root node will be different, from a different hash, different content. So if I try to decode the second file's encoded version uh, using the first file's hash, it will stop immediately. Let's just do that real quick. So let's call it bound code. This is bar two. Uh, I'm just going to call this control bar two. Bar two dot dot bound. Now go back to that decode. And now do this one. And this should fail immediately, again, because this is like a legitimately encoded file. Is that your question? Thank you. Live coding. The coding is always the wrong idea. Uh, this is going to fail immediately because the root node is different. So the very first thing that the decoder tries to verify will be the wrong hash. Um, and you can see the VLC refused to play it. And in this case, I have uh, back traces enabled and it panics. But you know, it basically it just fails to decode. The VLC receives no bytes through that pipe. Now. This is a cryptographic hash. This is, a, uh, this is designed for uh, very clever attackers, not just for people who have coded the wrong file. Um, so we can do more interesting things. Actually, I wrote a, a nice script this morning to enable this demo. You can think, what happens if you take the first encoded file, contain the video we want, and you reach in without changing the root hash or any of the intermediate parents, you reach in and change some of the bytes at the end, like change them to be the bytes from the second file with like a, a broken, corrupt tree on top of that. The decoder should be able to notice this because it's hashing everything. Let's see how. So my script is called swap. Did I call this barney.bound or did I call it barney.bound? I call it barney.bound, okay. And we're gonna swap in the content bytes from barney2 into that tree, illegally. Now what happens if I try to play that original tree that I just corrupted? That should be this one. I love this song. You guys love this song? I love this song. So again, these bytes so far are identical bytes. Nothing is different. But when it gets to the difference, the decoder notices that the hash no longer matches the chunks that it's using. And it stops. It stops emitting bytes. So when you're streaming an encoded file, you're checking that every single byte that you're getting out of that decoding is the right byte. Nothing can be changed. It's always possible to break the stream halfway through. That could happen if you pull a network cable, for example. And so whenever you're streaming, that's, that's what you're dealing with. But the attacker cannot change any bytes, which is, that was Barney the demo sort. So that's streaming. Uh, why would you? Why would anyone need something like this? And actually, uh, I, I, I tell fairly recently I was working for Keybase, um, and this came up. We we wanted to allow you to make attachments, for example, video attachments, or any attachments, to uh, cryptographic chat messages. Um, you know, the chat message is just like a JSON blob with some metadata, and that gets encrypted and signed. So the basic idea was, let's we'll just put the hash of the attachment in there and encrypt the attachment separately, so that it doesn't blow the, the JSON, um, and then just you know fetch it whenever you're trying to read it. Verify the hash. Great, right, right. Well, if it's the hash of like a JPEG or something, fine. Yeah, you download it, verify the hash, and display it. But if it's the hash of a giant movie and you're on your cell phone, what are you, you going to do? You're going to download the entire movie before you play the first frame? Like, no, no. Right? 
you want to be able to stream verified data while you verify that it matches a hash. Um, and when we ran into that problem, there wasn't really any off-the-shelf solutions, so we had to sort of hack around it. Um, but once BAL is stabilized, hopefully it will be the kind of thing that would be suitable for that kind of application. Um, there's also, you might, I know there's some people in this room that work on cryptocurrency because that's just that's the fun thing this year um, in the last five years. Uh, some people like to do those uh, schemes where they put the hash of a file or a contract or something in the blockchain, you know, or maybe IPFS, you know, some kind of distributed thing. Um, and this could work in those applications as well. If you want to be able to stream those files while you verify that they're correct, you need a tree hash like that. Okay. So here's the part at the top where we actually talk about Rust. Uh, this is all that uh, was implemented in Rust. That's one of the reasons it's very fast. Um, and as, every, as everyone who pays attention to the Rust propaganda knows, uh, Rust is very good at enabling safe parallelism. And Val takes advantage of that. This is also where the talk will get somewhat into the weeds for people who are not actually programmers, but I expect the majority of the audience is programmers. Uh, who here has used Rayon? That's, uh, that's almost half, that's cool. Um, Rayon is a library that was around, I think, before 1.0. Uh, this is another thing that I definitely demoed in my lightning talk before, so some of you will have heard me talk about this. Um, let me move that mouse pointer, that's infuriating, isn't it? Okay. Like I've never done this before. Um, so Rayon is all about what we call data parallelism. Uh, and it, and it, it's worth being very clear about how that is different from async I.O. or things like that. So you know, the whole idea of async I.O. Uh, is that you have a thousand TCP sockets and network connections or whatever, and you're, you're waiting for data to come over those. And, and, and that is tricky because you need to tell the operating system, like, hey, here's what I'm waiting on. Wake me up on one of these has data. That has to sort of bubble up through your entire programming language. That's heavyweight. And, and, and the trickiness of that problem is, is, is why async await will not land until, I don't know, February or something. Probably, probably some people in this room are following that more closely than, than I am. Uh, but data parallelism is easier. So you're not, you're, not wait, you're, not, you're not sleeping the process. You're not blocking on I.O. You're saying, hey, I have some data, like a vector or something. And I want to process the data, do something to every element. In my case, hash it, of course. Uh, and there's no, there, threads won't need to wait. It's just a question of doing the work as fast as possible. Just run the CPU as fast as you can. Please use as many threads as possible for this. Just do it. You know, the faster you can do it, the faster it'll be done. No one's waiting for anything. That's data parallelism. And it's a lot easier because you don't have to build your whole programming language. Right? So Rayon is all about that. And here we see uh, a sort of extracted and very slightly simplified um, recursive function that you might find if you look at the inside of BOW. Um, so like most recursive functions, this one has a base case and it has a recursive one. So the base case is saying, well actually, let's go back. The arguments are saying, here's an input, not a file in this case, it's just an array of bodies probably in a bank or something. Um, here's an input, hash that please. Uh, ignore the finalization argument that has to do with security, we'll get to it later. Um, just hash all that. So the base case is that the input we're hashing is a chunk or less. In which case, you just you just hash it. You actually call the underlying hash function. I, I, I papered over this before, but the general idea is you have a one of those serial hash functions we were talking about at the beginning. You use one of those to build the tree hash. So that's what hashes the leaves. So the base case is just do that. Hash the leaves the normal way. Um, in the Bow's case, that is the Blake 2 hash function. Um, and then the recursive rule. We split the input, split at being the standard Rust function for splitting a slice. Um, the index where we split it, this left limb, is uh, that's pretty important. That's that you know how your uh, tree layout is designed determines where you should split the input. So you have to be careful with the math there. But it's just like you know it's like roughly half. Um, split the input, hash the left, hash the right. This is hash recurs rare. It's calling itself. Um, so this is actually like really just one extra line compared to just writing the normal recursive function. But rayon colon colon join is going to run those two things in parallel if it can, which is amazing. So uh, rayon is going to use a cute little algorithm it calls work stealing. So the idea is that this thread or the, or the worker thread that 
sort of works on the habit of this thread will start doing the left thing, and it'll take the right closure and it'll put it on some stack somewhere, or a queue, you never know which one it is. Uh, and then other threads that happen to be free in the worker thread pool will come along, steal it off the queue, and start doing that work. So it might happen in parallel if there's threads free. Uh, otherwise, when the worker finishes with left, it'll just look at the queue and see if right is still there and do it if it's still there. That's worth stealing. Rand does that. It's pretty low overhead, pretty efficient. Um, and that just takes care of the threading problem. It's kind of amazing. So if you, uh, this laptop has four cores. So writing this function this way just gives me four times the, the performance of writing it. They're all workers in the way, which is amazing. It's no more work than that. Now we start really getting into the weeds. Uh, who here has, has used SIMD uh, or SIMD in Rust specifically? A small number of people. Uh, SIMD is a cute little acronym. It stands for Same Instruction Multiple Data. Uh, probably a lot of people have heard that one before. The idea is that instead of adding one integer to another integer, say, you add a vector of four integers to another vector of four integers, or something like that. Um, and that doesn't necessarily go four times as fast. You know, there's, there's various sources of overhead, but it goes faster. Um, and these, these SIMD instructions have been one of the big projects, I guess, that uh, CPU manufacturers like Intel have been working on for the last 20 years. Right? Like what, do, what do CPUs do right, the, over time? What's different between, from uh, a CPU 20 years ago to one today? Well, also, you know, they're faster. They, use, they run the same instructions faster, and that's nice. They have more cores, so if we have threads, we can use that. And they have these new fancy instructions. And SIMD instructions are a big part of it. Um, now, normally, your compiler is going to avoid these because it needs to emit code that will actually run on a computer that's like 10 years old, right? When you compile a binary, you expect it to run on another computer that's running your operating system. You're not saying, like, oh, that's, your machine's older than six months, I'm sorry, you can't run this binary. No one wants that. Right? So by default, compilers don't emit SIMD instructions and other things like that, but you can force the compiler to, and if you do that appropriately, you get a big speed up. So here's an example of a, what we call a SIMD intrinsic. It's not an instruction, it's an intrinsic. It's because I'm not writing assembly code I'm like Rust. I actually don't even know how to write assembly code. Um, so intrinsics are like sort of functions, but the compiler knows what they are and knows that they basically correspond to a single assembly instruction. Uh, and so when we use these intrinsic functions, that's basically forcing the compiler to use a specific instruction, which is cool. Unfortunately, their names are just wacky. I don't know what the MM stands for. I don't know what the EP stands for. I should look those things up. I stands for integer. Um, so what does this do? This is taking a 256-bit vector, um, treating it as though it contains four 64-bit integers, actually a pair of those, and adding them. Which is interesting because it, 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 the, first, the first thing it calls out is you can treat that vector as though it contains four 64 bit integers, or you can just treat it as though it contains eight or two bit integers. In fact, you can switch back and forth. Um, and sometimes clever algorithms do that. But this, it, it sort of highlights that, like, you can imagine there are like 32 or 64 different permutations of this instruction, and there are, and they all have wacky names, and some of them have an X on the end. So it's like, it's annoying. <laughs> it is annoying. And in using it, it's a bit tricky. Um, also, to yield the, the other key thing that anyone who's used Rust for a while will notice immediately is that it is unsafe. These functions are all unsafe, which is unsafe. Uh, because if you call them, if you if you run a function that uses these instructions on a machine that doesn't support them, it's undefined behavior. Hopefully it crashes, but assume most of the time it crashes. I don't know. That's the thing with undefined behavior. We never know. Uh, so the documentation here call, calls out that this is uh, an x86 specific, x86 or x64, x64, it turns out. Uh, and it relies on the AVX2 instruction set, which is fairly modern. I think that was probably like defined five years ago or something, um, and it's been shipping on consumer hardware for probably three years or something. My laptop is fairly new, it's like a year old, and it does support AVX2. When you use these things uh, in, in the functions that use them, you have to write something like this. So this is telling the compiler, hey, for this function, remember how you try to avoid you know, emitting non portable code? For this function, Omit not portable code. Assume that the target supports the AVX2. Uh, use annotations like that. And then when you use them, your calling code also has to be careful. Uh, so then the idea is that we won't, we won't even build, you know, we won't even call those intrinsics on non-X86 platforms because they're just that one we built. Uh, but on, on X86 platforms, so this block here is, is uh, config 
to only build Linux 86. We will run the dynamic CPU feature. Test. It's a fair bit of trouble, actually. Uh, and then if and only if uh, the, 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 the assembly instruction that tells you what features the CPU supports returns yes, if you in fact support ABX2, but if only if that happens, we will call a fast compression function or whatever it is that you do. Uh, it's a lot of trouble. It's easy to get wrong. It's not in code. You have to audit it. Uh, so it sucks. Uh, people are working on nicer, more modern libraries to make this stuff less, uh, easier, less problematic. Um, and those will probably take, I don't know, six months or a year or something before they get it like, really good. Um, so in the meantime, those of us who depend on ABX2 and other SIMD instruction sets for our work just have to cover them. So uh, how did these SIMD, SIMD vector instructions Get used. This is this is this is where the talk gets, gets really into the weeds. So actually, unless I get like a lot of really excited questions about this, I'm gonna kind of run through this part. It's it's, it's very weedy. Um, but this, what we're looking at here is the core of the Blake two hash function. It's not so different from most of your hash function. Um, and the idea here is that your state, uh, the state that you, what's the hash function doing? Right? It's taking input, it's mixing it into some state. Makes it takes more input, mixes it, in, takes more input, mixes it. In. The state that you keep. Uh, is uh, here it's represented. Let's, let's call it, let's call it 16 words. Sometimes it's 80, but let's call it 16. Uh, 16 words. V0 through V15 are words, and a word in this case is either 32 bits or 64 bits, depending on which variant you're talking about. Let's call it 32-bit integer. So we have these. Scratch it. Let's call it 64-bit integer. So we have these 16, 64-bit integers, and that's our state. So what Blake 2 does, the definition of the Blake 2 hash function, is it grabs columns. Through this matrix and mixes them, and the mixing function is like add this guy, this guy, and XOR these two things and rotate something. It doesn't. The details don't matter. But it mixes columns. So it mixes this column and this column and this column and this column, and then it mixes diagonals with the same mixing function, and it just repeats that like twelve times. It depends on which variant you're using, how many rounds of that it does. And so what you might notice is that mixing this column here, zero, four, eight, and twelve, is independent of mixing this column. It's independent of this one, this one. So those four things could be done in parallel. So the, the way you use SIMD here is you, this is tricky, you arrange rows in a vector. So one vector of four integers contains V0, 1, 2, and 3. Another vector contains 4, 5, 6, and 7. So the rows are vectors, SIMD vectors. And then when you, for example, would add V0 and V4 as part of the mixing function, you add the vectors. So it actually operates over all four at once. And then to do the diagonal thing, you do this cute trick where you rotate them. So this one rotates one place, this one rotates two places. So the diagonals become the columns and you repeat. And there's some overhead to do a diagonalization, but more or less, you can take advantage of that SIMD arithmetic, which is great. Uh, it turns out that if you have multiple inputs, so this is what you have to do when you want to hash one input as quickly as possible. If you're hashing more than one input, you can do even better. So instead of arranging these, these rows into vectors, we could instead take four inputs. So imagine four of these matrices. And we arrange not the rows or the columns, but rather the like Z axis or whatever, like out of the page. You, know, you sort of go across each of the inputs. So one vector would contain V0 from the first input, and V0 from the second input, and V0 from the zero. And the second vector would contain one, 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 one. Um, and then you do the arithmetic very similar to the way you did it before, but you no longer have to do that diagonalization step, so it's less open. So if you can arrange to hash four inputs in parallel or eight, depending on what variant we're talking about, it's actually a lot faster. So in some cases, it comes up even twice as fast. And you know, normally when we think about hashing inputs, they take one input. You're hashing inputs to make four inputs, because often we only have one. But when we're implementing a tree hash, we have as many as we want. So we can take four chunks or eight chunks, hash them all in parallel on one thread, and take advantage of that full set of efficiency. There's plenty of details that I can do here. I will stop forcing you to set it through. Let's go. That cuts out. Okay, we'll see. Mic down. Oh, I pushed the button. What? I'll just yell at everybody. Ah, oh, sweet. There's no. Well, in the meantime, I'll yell. I don't want to make you guys worry. Stuff does get weird here. Um, the last in the weeds topic I want to talk before I let everybody go is last questions. 
uh, and do the final demo. Ah, oh, I should have I should, I should have promised you. Thank you. Testing. Excellent. Excellent. I should I should have promised you the final demo because I want to you know give everybody a bribe to actually pay attention to the whole thing. Uh, I'm going to repeat that demo from the beginning. But I'm going to do it on a big piece of AWS hardware with 40 physical cores. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to see HTOP explode with percentages. Uh, that's fun. So the, the last like weeds topic before we before we get to the, the fun the last fun demo uh, is cryptography. So like we said, this is a cryptographic hash function, uh, and there are a number of sometimes fairly subtle properties that a cryptographic hash function is expected to uphold. Uh, and there are some very exciting ways that taking a normal, secure, standard hash function like SHA-2 or Blade 2 and making a tree out of it could screw it up. But you can take a secure hash function, make a naive tree out of it, and get an insecure result, which sucks, but we have to deal with this. So let's talk about some of the properties of cryptographic hash functions. They all have fun names. Uh, Pre-image resistance. Uh, the pre-image is just the input. I don't know why they call it the pre-image. I, I think some of this terminology is from the 70s. Uh, Pre-image resistance. That's, that's saying that when I hash some string, say a password, who knows about it, that um, might be secret, um, and I publish the hash, it should not be possible to work backwards and figure out what the input was. That's pretty important because we often use hashes for things like signatures and you know we put secrets into the hash. So that's pretty important. That you can't just like back out what the secret was. That's one of the inputs. We call that pre-image resistance. Of course, it's always possible to figure out what the input was by trying every possible input. You know, nothing will ever change that. Uh, but the idea is that if you care about your secrets, they have enough entropy, or that they're random enough that trying every possible input is uh, impractical. Uh, so that's pre-image resistance. That one's not too much of a problem. As long as you use a secure hash function to build your tree, you're not going to violate pre-image resistance. Collision resistance. This one is a big problem. So we want to make sure that no two different inputs can ever get the same hash. That would be a hash collision. Um, and you may remember that I talked about this a lot time, that a team from Google with some very expensive machines broke SHA-1 two, two years ago. I didn't remember what year it was then, and I don't remember now. But uh, what, what, what is breaking mean? Well, in this case, breaking means breaking the collision resistance, that is, finding a collision. So the team found two inputs, I think they published them as like two PDFs, but it could have really been anything, that are different, and they look different. You can look at them in PDF here and they are different. Uh, and they give the same SHA-1 hash. So that, that is considered a break. Um, why do we care so much about collision resistance? Because one of the ways we commonly use cryptographic hash functions is in signature schemes. So I might have a secret signing key or, or just a password if I want what we call Mac, a message, which we do all the time. Uh, and I might hash the secret together with a message or, or just hash the message and send it into some other fancy signing scheme. And if there's a collision in the hash function, then someone can take this signature that I made and pretend that what I signed was the other the colliding input. There's no way to distinguish them. They're the same hash. So any algorithm that just uses the hash is now treating these two files as equivalent. And obviously, a signature scheme should not treat two different inputs as equivalent. Uh, that's collision resistance. We need to preserve that. And we'll talk about how that ends up being trickier than it sounds. It probably sounds really tricky anyway, actually. And uh, link extension. This is um, anyone who followed the SHA-3 contest uh, is probably, is probably uh, aware that one of the features of modern hash functions that all the SHA-3 candidates had uh, is, I don't know if they call it length extension resistance, but anyway, they're not vulnerable to length extension. So the idea of a length extension is, if I take the hash of some secret file that I don't know, is there any way to perform extra steps on that hash, maybe add some more input or something like that, such that I can derive the hash of a related file, maybe a file with more bytes on the end, even though I didn't know the original file. That's what they call length extension. The idea of that would be, I've extended the length of the input without having the input. Uh, if I can do that, then maybe, you know, who knows what I can accomplish with a technique like that. If it's a signature scheme, maybe I can construct signatures of related files, depending on the details. Um, but everyone these days is like hash functions agrees that that sort of property is bad. You don't want to allow like, the attacker to derive the hash of inputs that the attacker doesn't know. Um, and this one, the tree can super duper break. So we'll see how that works. So this, again, this is another sort of in, in the weeds uh, example. But this is an example of how different tree designs might violate these properties. Uh, so the top one is a collision issue. So here we have a tree. Here's two trees in the same, say this is, like, say this is some sort of bow prime, some other tree design. This one, you'll notice, has more than two children per node. Whatever, it's a different design. But this is an example. Here we have a tree 
where the input is this four chunk message. And it happens to arrange the hashes of three of the chunks next to one of the messages and hash that. It's a little funky tree design. That's just an example. And here's a different input, three chunks this time. And one of the chunks we're calling M0 prime. If these are two valid trees in your tree design, if this is a, an arrangement of nodes and hashes that you could produce, you have a problem. Because M0 can be chosen such that the second half of it is equivalent to what we call the, the second chaining value. That was just the hash of this guy here. You could just choose an input that has the same bytes as that hash had. And so if you have a naive tree here that allows this sort of thing, you now have a collision. Regardless of whether the underlying hash function had collisions or not, you've now created one out of whole cloth um, by failing to kind of, what's, what's the fundamental failure here? This, this sort of the tree has not distinguished between whether some bytes here were input or were chain values. That's basically the problem. So you have to worry about that. Um, the second attack here, this is an example of a length extension. Um, it's a little different from the length extensions that you would see in MD5 or the, or the traditional hash functions. Here, we have that this is a more normal binary tree like BAO, probably in some people's mind. Here we have a, a two chunk input. We need the hash of that. Let's say this hash is published, but maybe the input's secret. The question is can we use that hash to construct the hash of a four chunk input? Can I take that two chunk root hash? and just kind of slot it in as though it was a chaining value from a subtree so that the final root hash is the correct answer for the whole thing, even though I may not have known these inputs. If I can do that, that's a length extension. And actually, length extension becomes kind of the wrong term because, it, as you can imagine, once we're talking about trees, you know, H could go, it could be this one. You know, who knows whether I've replaced the first hash or the second hash. Maybe I'm putting bytes in the front of the file, not the back. It's not necessarily an extension. It could just be some broader thing. These are all bad. Uh, so you have to be very careful to avoid this stuff. Um, there are good papers on this. There are proof frameworks for this. The real short version is that you have to make sure that your leaves and parent nodes never give the same hash, regardless of their inputs. There has to be some distinguisher, like an extra tag byte, or in the case of Blade 2, there are flags you can set, such that those hashes are guaranteed never to collide. You do that for your leaves and your parents, and you also do it for the root node and everything else. So you sort of you do those two what we call uh, domain separation, like extra tag bytes or, or something. You tweak the hash somehow to guarantee no collision, and it avoids those problems. There's a very technical framework for, for proving that you've done that, but that's the gist of it. So all of that is part of the bound design. Those details are all the spec. All right. So this is my friend. This is a this is an AWS M large twenty four. I don't even remember the name of this instance type. This is an AWS instance that we are SSH'd into uh, with forty six, I think, physical cores and ninety two logical cores. Let's take a look at it. This is the monster. We're SSH'ing the monster. This thing costs me like two dollars an hour, uh, and I love I love living in the future. <laughs> this is so beautiful. Uh, so let's let's use this monster. So here we have a 100 gigabyte file ish. Yeah. It's full of random data, and it took me like 15 minutes to create this file. I, that's probably an exaggeration. It took me some number of minutes to create this file. I did it at the start of this talk. <laughs> but it's done. Let's hash it. I hope this is in cash. I'm going to do this twice. Oh, we can do better. So that's, that's something over 33, maybe over 40 uh, gigabytes per second of throughput, and that is in software. That's in software. We're taking advantage of 70, but it's not hardware accelerated, SHA-1 or anything like that. That's a software hash. Um, I will start. Uh, SHA-1 going on the same file, and then while it's running, I'll take questions.
Thank you guys for listening. Any questions? This kind of leads later. Please. Where, where is the release process this time? Can we finalize? Um, Could you repeat the question? Yeah, where, how, how long do we, do we think it's going to take to get a 1.0? Um, it's always hard to say in business, isn't it? But optimistically, a month. Um, maybe more realistically, a couple months. Um, and then there's there's your sort of intent to standardize, where I would say like, oh, it's done. I'm not gonna make. I don't intend to make any more major prep or changes or changes the output. And then there's the point when actual cryptographers sign off on it, which would be some amount of time after that. Um, who I, I don't actually have enough experience to give a meaningful answer to that part of the question, but maybe it'll be like genuinely useful in a year, and like risky useful in like two months. Uh, I'll just go around this way. Yeah. Uh, so so Blade Two is doing like the shipping route. It is. So you're just you layered on top of that the tree structure. So That's right. Like, like the cryptography people have to verify is to even verify, but it's not like it, 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 it starts from a good base. Yes. So, so the, the question is, is it, is it not a patent case that we are taking advantage of the sort of widely agreed upon security of Blake 2 and just building on top of that? And that is, that's true. Um, there are... Which is a good thing. It's that's a good thing. It's more likely it's going to be a good thing. Yes. Yes, the, the idea here is that it should not require, you know, it's, you're just taking an existing secure hash function, applying a paper written by real cryptographers, and all we have to do is verify that the proven paper applies to the design. Uh, that's true. There, one of the things we've been discussing, actually, is I talk with some of the designers of Blink2 um, as like possibilities for, if not this hash function, maybe future ones, is that uh, the compression function in Blink2, um, it, it takes message input, but it also takes other inputs, so it takes a, it takes a block counter, um, which is part of the security, and sort of which lock number is this, it makes it harder to attack the hash function, it takes some other flags. Um, you could repurpose those flags as more input. So you could basically like increase the throughput of the, the compression function. That would be wild. that would be not like two anymore, it'd be something else. Um, it's an option, and maybe if we were designing this from scratch, you know, something there would be changes. Um, but to, yeah, the, the, to the actual question, yes, this is a basically small construction on top of a secure hash function, which is nice for the analysis. Finished. Hey, how long did that take? Minute, two minutes. Two minutes. We got to run it again, though, right? Uh, I, no, it, it should, <laughs> the, the pages should be in cache, and I think those two minutes are valid. Let's. Of course, SHA one is broken. Let's see how long SHA one twelve takes. Can you can you age top it with Oh, of course, I missed that. Let's age top it with Kill that. This is tricky because Bow is quite fast, so I have to get over. We age top one. What's the flag that I want? Dash N? No. C? T? I'm not going to try anymore. Maybe it was C. Let's see what happens. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's so beautiful. I think red is, I, I think, someone who knows HTML better can tell me, I think green is, your CPU is doing actual work, and red is it's like blocked on IO or something like that, but I don't actually know. Question. So, like, you used we a lot for talking about the people working on it. So I've heard this before, but who is exactly the group of people working on it? Yeah, I probably mostly use the word we to add credibility. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I credited a couple guys in the beginning, uh, Zuko Wilcox O'Hearn and Samuel Nevis, who are two of the designers of the Blade 2 hash function, have been answering many of my questions. And it's, it's extremely helpful, and they've been giving me a bunch of uh, suggestions. Um, and they will help me hopefully uh, analyze the final result. One of the suggestions they actually had, I'll, I'll get into this real quick without diving into it because no one actually asked me, is we can use the Blake 2 S hash function instead of Blake 2 B, and it's actually faster. So the difference between Blake 2 S and Blake 2 B is that S takes 32 bit words and B takes 64 bit words, which normally means that B is faster on like, you know, 64 bit Intel hardware because uh, you're taking advantage of the full arithmetic unit or whatever that part of the CPU is called. But when you parallelize everything across those semi vectors, uh, there's really no difference once you start pretending that it's eight 32 bit integers or four 64 bit integers. Um, you get roughly the same throughput through the 70 execution units. Um, and so we can use Blade 2S with no penalty on 64 bit systems, and it makes it much faster on 32 bit systems like ARM or old ARM. Anyway. Uh, yes, let's go. Ahead. How do you read 100 gigabyte file in four seconds? Uh, this, the, how, do I, how do I read a 100 gigabyte file in four seconds? So this. That part about making sure everything's in the page cache is really important. So the, this is a giant Amazon VM with, I think if I make the screen smaller, it'll tell me how much memory it has. 
it's like a three-digit number of gigabytes. They can read to the top of the tower. It's like 180 gigabytes, whatever. So this this uh, this machine has the entire 100 gigabyte file in memory. So all you're doing is reading memory. And then another thing that I will do is memory map the whole file so that threads have a very easy time just jumping to the back of it as though it was a vector or something like that. That's not strictly required. You can sort of hack around that with file descriptors and some of the like Linux specific APIs that let you read and see atomically, things like that. You could do that, but uh, memory mapping is much easier and also slightly faster. If you want to see the memory, you could do free dash h on the command line. Free dash h. It's a big number. Yeah, I don't know if you said before, but what company do you work for and why did you need this? <laughs> what company do I work for and why do I need this? Right now, I'm actually on my own. I, I spend a lot of my time just working on this project and also traveling at the moment, which is nice. Um, I was at Keybase. So we were, uh, we, Keybase is, and, and I was, um, a developer on, on cryptography applications for regular people. So like encrypted chat, encrypted and authenticated chat messages and things like that. So we needed it because we, the immediate reason we could have used it but had to go for something else was that we wanted to hash attachments and enable you to stream those attachments if they were like videos. When you say a security proof, is it a mathematical proof that if like two is secure, yours is secure? Or is it yes. more of a proof that there's no known screw up in like doing a tree that we know about? Yes. So the, the, the question is what exactly does security proof mean? Is it, is it, is it extending, is it assuming the security of like two? The answer is yes. So it's assuming the security of the underlying primitive. Uh, you're proving that you haven't uh, broken any properties. And I'm going to make sure I get the right buzzword. I believe it is assuming that the underlying function is secure in the random oracle model. The tree hash is either also secure in the random oracle model or like a slightly different thing that just follows from it being a tree that is basically the same. Uh, and I don't know all of the buzzwords to answer that question thoroughly. Can you go a little bit more depth about how you discriminate uh, leaf nodes and parent nodes with the with extension attacks? Sure. Um, so the, the, the question was, can I go into a little more depth about how I prevent length extension attacks by discriminating between uh, leaf nodes and root nodes? It, it's actually, so what, what I would call domain separating leaves and parents. Yeah, that's the, that prevents collisions. I always have to do this in my head. Yeah, domain separating the root, but that is what you asked, but domain separating the root from everything else. And actually, worth going over briefly, I didn't have a picture, but the root could be a chunk. So if, it, if the file's like one byte, and all you have is a one byte chunk, that, that is the root, there's no, there's no parent. So the root, uh, parent, or chunk, um, yeah, it needs to be domain separated from the rest. So there's different ways you could do that. So for example, if you were using like SHA-2 or a function that doesn't have any like fancy knobs, flags, um, you could just say, Anything that's not the root gets an extra zero byte appended to it. And anything that is the root gets an extra one byte appended to it. If you did that, then they're guaranteed never to be the same. You know, the, and so assuming that whatever function doesn't produce collisions for different inputs, you, then you, you know you don't have a collision. And you could do that with more than one. So in our case, you could, you could have two tag bytes. You could have the, the root or not root tag byte, and you could have the leaf or chunk, sorry, leaves and chunks are the same, the parent or chunk tag byte. You, you could do that. That's an example. That's maybe the simplest example. In the case of like two, there actually are knobs and flags and stuff, so you can set uh, an integer as part of the initial relation vector and distinguish it between things. Um, and that's the finalization function also accepts a flag. It was intended for tree hashing, but we're kind of abusing its exact intention. <laughs> I won't get into too many details. Yeah, that's the second thing. Uh, so, the getting around the diagonal of the Sounds like it's all set up to work on 256 bits, because that's the EXT or whatever. But when the 512 instructions come out, are you going to be able to like, make it even better? The... Good, good question. Yeah, there, there was a small note about this that I completely lied over in one of my slides. Um, do, do, do. Yes. When it, so the question was when ABX 512 comes out, you know, is that good for the world? Um, for my world. Uh, yes. So, um, as you were describing in your question, if the vector covers an entire row, and then Intel, by the grace of their generosity and genius, <laughs> gives us bigger vectors, you know, does that help? And the answer is, in that case, not really, because the row is a certain size, and having a vector that can add more things doesn't 
doesn't immediately help you. But in the second approach, where the vectors go like into the page or whatever across inputs, um, it very naturally helps you. You just immediately now hash twice as many inputs in the same number of instructions. <coughs> very good chance, just for thermos, that AVX 512 will not, will probably like heat up the processor or something. There are various sources of overhead, so it probably won't run at twice the speed. Um, you know, and, and it may be that future generations of the AVX Factor implementations uh, improve on that. Yeah, who knows? I think that's the story of sort of all of these things. But it will be better. Um, and, we'll, it, then, and when that comes out, I, my, I, I've uh, promised myself that I won't buy a new laptop until I can get AVX 512 <laughs> in the, supporting the processor. That's my sort of self control strategy. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to write that code as soon as I have a laptop to run it. Um, are there any AMD variants of the code? Like XOP or those, those. Yeah, I I'm not familiar enough. So the question was whether there are any AMD specific instruction set extensions that could help here. The answer is I'm sure there are. There are. I, there the sort of sort of semi official. Like one of the authors of Blink Two has a get a project that is C code with various SIMD implementations of Blink Two and, and Blink Two B and Blink Two S. Um, and there is some code in there that uses XOP, which I believe is an AMD extension. Um, I think the answer is that roughly AMD implements the same AVX2 instructions, so there's not too much difference for this, and I don't know about the future of uh, an AVX512 or something like AMD. The answer is basically I don't know. What happens if Blade 2, Blade 2 gets broken? If Blade 2 gets broken, then this is all for nothing. Uh, I mean, everything here, of course, assumes the security of Blade 2. Luckily, um, there's not too much Blade 2 specific stuff in the design, so if, if if the world was scrambling to switch to SHA-3, or God forbid, SHA-4, you know, or whatever, um, it would be fairly straightforward to just sort of copy and paste different hash functions into the right places. We, uh, as we were talking about before, I do use Blade 2 specific features to do domain separation, so you need to be very careful to preserve the domain separation requirements with some other hash function, um, but there's nothing hard about it, it's just details. I think you said something early on along the lines of like, benchmarks being a scam. So, like, <laughs> what do you do to performance tests you know, to decide if uh, something is an optimization or not? What do I do to performance tests to avoid being to avoid lying through my teeth? Um, <laughs> I pray. Let me let me let me show, let me show you an example. So uh, this will be on I'll leave all these on my machine because I know I have the commands in history. So this was the time that I got for that app that's a gigabyte file. If I disable turbo boost on this machine, which is an Intel processor feature, and rerun that, it takes like twice as long. Because turbo boost is nice. The turbo boost is um, roughly a way Intel engineers figured out how to overclock processors temporarily until they heat up too much, and then, and then stop doing that. Uh, and while Turbo Boost is enabled, you get these like amazing speeds. And when you turn it off, you get less amazing speeds. Um, and Turbo Boost is finicky. You know, the more you, the more benchmarks you run, the hotter your machine gets, and the less advantage you get to take Turbo. So your, the benchmarks you run first go faster than the ones you run second. It's, it's all terrible. So the first thing you do is you disable stuff like this and try to disable Turbo Boost. I, I find that I have to kill GNOME. I, I kill my desktop. I get more consistent result because you know if I'm hashing, if I'm if I'm benchmarking Blade Two. Blade, Blade 2S or Blade 2B or, or SHA-1 or something which runs on one core, it's not too bad because I probably have an idle core. You know, the desktop isn't doing that many things. Um, though it, it still does something, it's not perfect. But when I'm benchmarking BAL, you know, it's trying to peg all of my cores. So I have to make sure that like, literally nothing else in the machine is causing any processor noise at all, which is tricky. Um, I'm not even 100% confident that this AWS machine I have is like on its own hardware. I think I might have gotten a shared instance. So there's, there's like five million problems. Um, my, my, my greatest hope is that the problems affect other hash functions equally. And so as long as I benchmark them together and like change the order around, you know, it, it, hopefully it's valid. Well, I actually meant like comparing yourself to like, when you change a line of code or, you know, you think oh. something is an optimization. Yeah, oh, sorry, thank I found you. that sometimes I think something is an optimization and it isn't. Yes, um, right, how do I make sure that my optimizations are actually better? I have not yet run into anything that is better on, a, like, for example, a cold machine, but worse on a warm machine. Yeah, luckily, I haven't run into those problems yet. Um, oh, I feel like I have a couple stories, and if I think of them, I'll come back to them. 
some people arouse a lot. Um, go ahead. Are there other tree based uh, hash uh, construction functions or constructions out there, or would this be, is it just Merkle Demigard and this would be kind of the first alternative? The question is like other like standards, for example. Yes, there are. This is not the first one. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any other like software that tries to enable the streaming stuff, but in principle, um, that could be done with other tree hashes that have existed. Um, for example, uh, there was one called Tiger, or like the, something hex exchange, or I have a link in deep in the spec, it's like previous work. Um, they somewhat standardized that for, that actually was for streaming, um, and it looks similar, um, and in the paper, in the, in, in the slides, there were that the people talking about how to prove the security of tree bugs. They actually discuss some of the details of the Tiger standard, which is from like the 90s, and it used like XML. Like it's, <laughs> it's rough. But, uh, and it actually, for example, did not prevent like extension attacks. Um, it was designed for applications where that probably didn't matter, so it's not like a huge deal. But like, it, it, there's, there is some prior art. Um, interestingly, the designers of, uh, oh god, how do you pronounce it? Ketchak? Someone in the room knows how to pronounce the name of that. Shah 3. You know. The designers of Shah 3 um, have published some derived hash functions that use the same permutation, um, but in a different mode. One of them is called Kangaroo 12, because we can't control ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Kangaroo 12 is, in fact, a tree hash, though it's, it's sort of under the covers, and I think it is a tree hash solely so that the implementation can get parallelism advantages. And what they do is it's a two-level tree. So it's not actually like a binary tree. It's like you have one root node and then everything. So then they all they sort of all feed in. So you, you know, if you have enough cache or whatever, you can you can hash everything in parallel or some number of them in parallel. They publish a SIMD implementation. Um, and then event, and then you just feed those hashes into the one state that consumes the digests. Um, and that that works for like small degrees of parallelism, that's that's perfectly fine. Um, it's simpler to implement. And importantly, the total state size is smaller. So if you're one of those like, routers or whatever, microcontrollers, and you're like, oh god, like 600 bytes is all I have for your hash state machine, like I'm screwed. Like there's, it takes like, it's, I think it's double. I think you have to maintain state for two hashes, the root hash, and the minimum you need to maintain is whatever node you're working on. Whereas, uh, we didn't discuss this in the talk, but BOW has somewhat larger storage requirements. So if, uh, I think the minimum state size for Blake 2 is like 300 something bytes, and Bao has to maintain a stack of subtree hashes. I should have a diagram. It's useless to try to explain it's not a diagram. It has to maintain a stack of subtree hashes that takes like a kilobyte and a half. So it's like a factor of six or something, I, I, you know, larger, which is like for some crazy embedded applications like that. So anyway, Kangaroo 12 is an example of another tree hash that makes different design decisions. Yeah. That was a long answer. All right. Oh, there's one. When you say streaming video, you, this is a streaming where you guarantee you're receiving every frame, right? Like if you couldn't implement like a UDP streamer and like lose a frame because then you just lose like the whole chunk of the video. So, the, 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 so, so when I, when I, when people talk about streaming, like for example, something like Twitch, you can lose like a couple of frames and just carry on. And not worry about it, but you wouldn't have the data to be able to actually like recover the hash for at least a chunk of the video there. Great. So the question is, how does streaming and potentially losing chunks interact with these sort of underlying framing that video formats will use, where they try to match what is it, frame size or some group of frames to a UDP packet to gracefully lose data if you use yeah, packets? Yeah. Um, the answer is it. The answer is I don't know because I'm not a video guy. Um, I'll make up an answer. The so the. The, the, the chunk, the, yeah, this is something that you might have to worry about. Um, so what will happen is if you lose a packet, you will lose, that's interesting. If you lose a packet that contains a root node, you're screwed. You know, you need to be trying to do that. Um, it, so yes, if you were trying to UDP stream bow encoded video, you have a problem. Um, you have a problem that you need to solve the protocol. Because you need to make sure that the important parts of your tree, you, know, you don't care if you drop a, trunk, a chunk, or even if you drop a parent, then you drop four chunks. But like if you drop all or half your video, you need to be transmit. Um, yes, that would need to be solved at the level. If you're TCP streaming the video, you have no problem. Yeah. That was an interesting question. Just uh, one last question. Last question. Just, uh, if, if you need to call it many times because you're doing, you're 
what's the overhead of calling it um, in the tight loop? Calling bow in a, in a tight loop or hashing a bunch of small inputs with bow? Right. Um, what's the overhead with that? Um, not much. So as I sort of briefly alluded to. The use case I'm looking at is that you're trying to verify assets that you're storing, you're, you're pointing to in the database and you want to verify it's the same. Like you have hashes of individual rows in your database or something like that? Not just rows, but external assets, and you want to make sure that you're the same. So you're computing like 100,000 hashes or yeah. something like that? Yes, as, as long as if the hash, if the inputs, if the, if the inputs are big, you don't care because each one takes a lot of time. Anyway. If the inputs are small, it's, it's, it's designed to have very little overhead. So I alluded to how if you have, say, one byte or 10 bytes, really, um, the tree is just a node. It's just, it's just that one chunk, which may be short, um, and you just hash that. So bow adds. Eight bytes of hashing over. So if your if your inputs are all one byte, it's up because now your inputs are nine bytes. But if your inputs are like a kilobyte or something, now they're a kilobyte plus eight, which is, no one cares. Um, no, I meant like calling it as a process because oh, calling it as a process. I see. So the app itself is not in Rust, so you can integrate this. Gotcha. Um, yes, if you were to shell out to bow to hash a million files, you would suffer. You would suffer whatever process overhead is in the kernel. I yeah. The, Rust, the, the Bow implementation here is, is available as a Rust library. So if you're writing Rust programs, you can just link it um, through Karma, totally normal library. Suppose it's a safe interface. Um, that should be essentially no overhead. Um, yes, I don't recommend shelling out in super high performance loops. But no, I'm just new to Rust, and I'm not sure about the C Rust interface. Yes, um, the C Rust interface in general is very smooth. So for example, if you uh, have a C function that wants to call Rust, that's no different from a C function calling another C function from a dynamic library, I believe. People can well, dynamic, yeah. correct me. Yeah, because you right, it's not you you can't inline Rust in the C. You also need to like export the, an interface for that C function also. Yes, you can't right, you can't use like Rust in traits, you know, and expose that to C. You have to do the normal the same way C might talk to C, I think you would do like a C style interface. Rust is the same thing. That's a yeah, that's not specific to Bow, of course, that's just Rust. That's one more. All right, one last one, actually. Are there other applications beyond just the streaming, like, um, like you know, Git, Git computes the, the SHA-1? Are there other applications that you expect people to jump on this and say, wow, this is so much faster than our existing world? Like, what is it just, you know, I'm not, I know it's used all over the place, but the signatures aren't usually that big, so it's probably not a big deal there. But um, anything, are there other big file applications that you're immediately thinking of? Good question. I actually, uh, are there other big file applications that I expect to jump on this? I need a better list of examples. So yeah. Git is a good one because some people have gigantic files. Right. Um, what was the other one I was thinking of? I mean, I do it by hand sometimes when I download stuff. Um, something like BitTorrent is a likely candidate. So one of the one of the nice things we we alluded to briefly. There's that need for trying to be authoritative. <laughs> um, I alluded to uh, slicing features. So for example, if you had a BitTorrent style application that took a bow hash. You could fetch arbitrary slices from any client, which is very cool. Like you don't have to define them at the time. Um, that's potentially useful, and, and I'm sure all of those are limited by network bandwidth and not CPU speed, though. Um, yeah, I actually have a hard time thinking of applications that desperately need a fast hash function. Something like that for a project in that sense. But some of them do. <coughs> yeah. Well, and then the I guess you're going to try to get this used on the download sites, right? I mean, be it'd be phenomenal for downloading like a OS image and whatnot, right? It'd be so much yeah, faster if, to check it. If you hash something after you're done downloading it, it's great because you don't have to wait like 10 seconds. If you hash it while you're downloading it, which you should do if you're doing any kind of like software implementation or some protocol, yeah. maybe it's not automatic. Yeah. All right, thanks guys.